Hello, and thank you for checking out this audio revision guide from MrAlsopHistory.com. You can visit my website to download free history revision podcasts on this topic and a whole load of others. In this particular episode, we're going to focus on the course and consequences of the First Gulf War. In the previous podcast, we explored a range of factors that contributed to the outbreak of what has become known as the First Gulf War. In this episode, we'll seek to understand what happened after the huge multinational force of over 700,000 troops launched its military action to liberate Kuwait. On the 29th of November 1990, the UN had given Iraq an ultimatum – withdraw from Kuwait by the 15th of January 1991, or face military force. As the UN's deadline to withdraw approached, Saddam refused to exit from Kuwait. Consequently, the combat phase of the First Gulf War, known as Operation Desert Storm, began shortly after midnight on the 17th of January. Just a few hours later, Saddam Hussein appeared on state radio, saying that the great duel, the mother of all battles, has begun. The dawn of victory nears as this great showdown begins. He couldn't have been more wrong. Following five weeks of aerial bombardment, the coalition's ground assault forced the Iraqi troops from Kuwait in just four days. The Desert Storm aerial bombing campaign saw over 2,250 coalition aircraft fly in excess of a thousand sorties a week for five weeks. Seeking to destroy key military targets and to disrupt civilian infrastructure, live footage of the campaign was broadcast around the world on satellite TV. Having virtually destroyed Iraq's air force and anti-aircraft defences, the coalition quickly established air supremacy. A veteran Iraqi soldier from the Iran-Iraq war even commented that his brigade had suffered more damage from the coalition air force than from eight years of fighting against Iran. Saddam hoped in vain that the level of destruction caused by the coalition's vastly superior air force would result in world opinion turning against them. Finding that this didn't happen, however, he instead tried to break up the Western Arab coalition by launching Scud missile attacks on Israel. Israel was not a part of the coalition, but if it was to join the war, its involvement would have made continued Arab support difficult as they wouldn't want to be fighting on the same side as the Israelis. In the event, however, Israel was convinced by the United States not to respond to the missile strikes, and consequently the coalition held together. By the time the coalition launched its full-scale ground attack on the 24th of February, Iraq was already at a significant disadvantage. Although a number of smaller missions had already demonstrated that Iraq's dated military equipment and poorly trained army was no match for the coalition forces, US generals were still surprised at the speed of their advance. An estimated 10,000 Iraqi prisoners were taken on just the first day. On the 27th of February, less than four days after the ground invasion began, Saddam Hussein called for a retreat from Kuwait. Some Iraqi troops continued to engage in fierce fighting at Kuwait International Airport, but by the following day, United States President George Bush had declared Kuwait liberated. As they retreated from Kuwait, however, Iraqi forces employed a scorched earth policy that saw them set fire to almost 700 Kuwaiti oil wells and place landmines around the oil fields in the hope of making it more difficult to extinguish the fires. 
On the 28th of February, President Bush called for a ceasefire. While this was being negotiated, a series of uprisings began in both northern and southern Iraq against Saddam's rule. America hoped that the uprisings would lead to an internal coup d'etat that would overthrow Saddam, and so the rebellions by Kurds in the north and the Shiites in the south were encouraged by the government. However, they received no physical US support in terms of troops or equipment, and were therefore ruthlessly crushed by Saddam's loyal generals, and this, in turn, led to a humanitarian crisis that was only solved when the coalition introduced no-fly zones to protect civilians from Iraqi attacks, and which led to the establishment of the Kurdistan regional government. The ceasefire was imposed by the United Nations. Alongside other terms, Iraq had to recognise Kuwaiti sovereignty and pay reparations for the damage caused during the war. Furthermore, a series of punishing trade sanctions were imposed on Iraq while UN weapons inspectors searched for and destroyed weapons of mass destruction, including biological, chemical and nuclear weapons. The sanctions prevented the import of a huge range of items, ranging from machinery to medicines to books. Iraq was also only able to sell very limited amounts of oil, which thus had a direct impact on its ability to buy those few items that it was allowed to import. Furthermore, a ban on the importation of chemicals such as chlorine, which could be used to make WMDs, but is also used to purify water, led to outbreaks of dysentery as a result of people drinking contaminated water. Up to half a million children died as a result of hunger and disease during the period of the sanctions, with up to 7,000 dying every month by 1997. The Oil for Food programme was therefore introduced by the UN in 1996 and did go some way to solve the humanitarian crisis. The decision at the end of the war to call a ceasefire rather than to push on to Baghdad and remove Saddam from power was heavily criticised by some members of the American government. However, such action would have risked fracturing the coalition since its UN-sanctioned mission only went as far as liberating Kuwait. With this objective met, American troops therefore began to leave the Gulf area on the 10th of March. The search for weapons of mass destruction was subsequently conducted by the United Nations Special Committee, known as UMSCOM. Iraq cooperated with the weapons inspectors due to the devastating effects of the sanctions and even admitted to stockpiling a range of weapons including nerve gas and chemical warheads. Furthermore, the inspectors found enriched uranium that could be used to manufacture nuclear weapons. It took three years for UNSCOM to destroy the materials that Iraq could use to manufacture WMDs and to remove all medium and long-range missiles. Sanctions were having a huge effect on the living conditions of ordinary Iraqis and the government was keen to have them lifted. However, the government also failed to provide proof that they had actually destroyed stocks of anthrax and nerve gas themselves. Coupled with the defection of Saddam's son-in-law, who claimed that Saddam had ordered that WMDs be hidden, the United States were unwilling to lift the sanctions unless Saddam himself was removed from power. Despite the devastating effects of the economic sanctions on the country, Saddam managed to maintain control of Iraq. He continued to use violence and terror to suppress his enemies and rewarded those who remained loyal to him. 
You can find out more about these systems of control and how they affected life in Saddam's Iraq in a separate podcast at MrAllsopHistory.com. Meanwhile, Saddam sought sympathy from the rest of the Arab world by filming and broadcasting the suffering of the Iraqi people that had been brought on as a result of the sanctions. After he expelled the UN weapons inspectors in 1997, America and Britain responded with airstrikes against military sites. The bombing campaign and the ongoing sanctions won him further support, and by the year 2000, Saddam had restored diplomatic relations with all his neighbouring countries. While the First Gulf War had shown Saddam that he was unable to match the world's military might, he had at least managed to stay in power. <laughs>